Malcolm Wilde, horological toolmaker and winner of the prestigious Barrett Silver Medal by the BHI, chats about some of his favorite tools and some of the tools he's made. In this episode, we look at the depthing tool. The clockmaker's depthing tool is essential for any good restoration work. In the 70s, when I searched round for such a tool, there were none available, none had been made for many, many years. And it was my theory that uh, whilst a lot of the small watchmakers ones are still available and they're quite cheap, these big ones are big lumps of brass which are probably used for the war effort because when you looked in the early catalogues, 1900 catalogues, then there was a big range, a large range of tools from small French lock size right to really big ones. So um, as I say, the first ones that I made were really crude, they were made in aluminium and they weren't very good at all and I developed, it's not easy to do to get all the bores in line and I developed a system, use various drills which you know uh, deep hole drilling drilled all sorts of things and eventually um, I now use D bits which I'm sure that the Victorians must have used you know way gone by because but then when the tool is finished and the, the, the hinges are soldered on do the drilling, hinging, then they go, when they finish, uh, my nephew, he does lots of the work on the finishing, then we have them powder coated, and then they, uh, they distort because of the heat, but it's 200 degrees C. Then, when I set to, I can, I've got to bed them in, and it might take me a day to do one tool, it might take me two hours, but it's a really big job, they've got to be so accurate, and um, this is why they're so expensive. The smaller one, um, uh, the French lock size, um, developed this for carriage clocks. And uh, so this, I've not sold so many of these, um, but this is quite a neat little tool. And again, none of these were available in the uh, tool catalogues. I searched, and when Clark and Will was still going in the late 60s, early 70s, there was just nobody available to make these. So I developed this. I probably only made maybe two or three hundred, that's all, this small one. But we are making another batch of 15, and it may be the, the last batch, I don't know, but I've got some orders already. And then um, one of the larger tools, going back to that, has just been ordered by uh, the uh, Buckingham Palace. There are a lot of nuances and interesting technical details about the depthing tool and we'll have a look at some of them now. This happens to be one of Malcolm Wilde's large clockmaker's depthing tools and here we see it being removed from its fitted case. So you can get a lot of accessories, different runners and there are two main types First of all, we have this one with the extended cone. As you can see, there is the original diameter and it has this brass affix attached to it and that helps you measure against larger holes. The other one has this large brass cup runner and this allows uh, the setting up of barrel arbors, even bird up old uh, winding squares if you really have to. Then there's a stirrup attachment. And so some depthing tools have uh, a full stirrup like this and others have only three sides of, uh, of that attachment. And this is used when setting up the escapement of long case clocks and similar so there's the recoil escape wheel from a very classical English 30 hour clock. And we see that uh, little center in the end of the stirrup there. And that's the pallet frame. And the crutch would normally exactly clash with one of the runners of uh, the depthing tool. But thanks to that stirrup, you can see that the crutch can now clear. And now you can set the whole thing up and you can test the correct depth of your escapement. Over here, I've set it up nice and close, which really is best practice. 
actually these pallets are faced with mainspring. It's a, it's an older repair, but you can see there's a very gentle amount of uh, free drop. If I open the tool out slightly, there's a lot more drop. A lot of clock makers and clock owners think that a nice loud tick is a sign of a healthy clock, but actually it's a lot of wasted energy that's not getting to the pendulum and therefore you have to replace that energy. Here it's at its extreme end of wasted energy. When I open it slightly more, it starts to run through. So that would be too wide. A few notes on how to hold the depthing tool. You want to hold it in such a way that you don't put any strain on the opening or closing of it, nor on the runners themselves. Then after you've set up or pitched the tool as, uh, as required for whatever work you're doing, you want to make sure that it's upright. And so here you can see I've released the left clamp and just sw swiveled it and to make sure that the tool is dead perpendicular to work. And again, holding it in such a way so as to not put any strain on those nice straight runners. How to actually use the depthing tool. So you might think it's just a question of spinning a wheel against another wheel until it spins as freely as possible or as quietly as possible. But there's more to it than that. Here's a close up with two different wheels and you can see I've actually got my thumb on one of the arbors. I'm, I'm adding some drag. Now in this next setting, I'm widening it and it actually clears the pinion. So there, that would be way too wide. But the point is holding your thumb there, you get, first of all, a bit of drag into the system and it gives you tactile feedback because what you're feeling for is if there's any notchiness or kind of clicking as the tips of the teeth butt against the incoming tips of the uh, pinion leaves. And what you're feeling for really is as smooth a motion as possible because ideally there needs to be a uniform lead so that the drive to the escapement isn't notchy or jerky. And so it's a question of testing the optimum depth. There is no perfect cutter uh, that uh, you can use for clocks. And that's why the depthing tool allows you to sort of get that optimum balance. If you want to level up your depthing tool use, take a measurement across the runners after you've set the tool as desired. Then no matter how good or bad the tool is perceived to be, you can reset the tool to that measurement just at the moment you want to make the scribe marks. Now, I don't exactly show this method here, but I am demonstrating how you can measure across the width of the runners. And in this case, the depthing tool happens to be running really parallel. But the point is, but it doesn't have to be. Once you've got the reading, you can reset your depthing tool to exactly that reading around the position of the scribing points. So no matter if your depthing tool is very good or not so good, you can always have an arc of exactly the size you require. Here's an interesting accessory. It kind of looks a bit like half of a depthing tool, but it's got the supporting feet and also a bracket with these two mounting holes. And the purpose of this is quite interesting. It's designed to be fixed solidly onto one limb of the depthing tool with uh, thumb screws or other screws. And as you can see, it mounts another frame perpendicular to the main frame. And so this sort of attachment would be used when you want to test the depthing of contrate wheels. So as often used in verge escapements where you've got wheels at 90 degrees to each other, or perhaps in carriage clocks, although this tool is a bit big for carriage clocks. That right hand limb isn't used in this case, and so might be as well just to close the tool up and make it a bit less unwieldy. And then the right hand accessory or the contrate accessory would fit neatly into that space, probably a bit higher, mounted a bit higher than that. And there are also special runners that you'd use because the arbors will need to intersect. And so they'll, they'll pass those uh, gaps in the frame. Learn clock and watchmaking at the BHI and learn about antique tools and horology at the Museum of Timekeeping.